Arrivals at Tilbury. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans. Many are ex-servicemen who know England. They serve this country well. In Jamaica, they couldn't find work. Discouraged but full of hope, they sailed for Britain. Citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Prodded by public opinion, the colonial office gives them a more cordial reception than was at first envisaged. Many are to be found jobs. Our reporter asks them what they want to do. Now why have you come to England? To seek a job. And what sort of job do you want? Any type, so long as I get a good pay. Some will go into industry, others intend to rejoin the services. Now you're an ex-Air Force, aren't you? Yes. Are you going back into the Air Force again? Yes. Did you know if you'll be accepted? I think so. Some plan to return to Jamaica when conditions improve. I'd like to ask you, please, are you a single man? I am a single man. My, only my mother that is depending on me. And I'm also an ex-service man. Oh, ex-service? RAF, yeah, are you? RAF. I took a course in Scotland in case making. And uh, I'm desirous of going back there to see if I can further because I like it very much. And uh, I'm trying to help myself and also help my mom. Their spokesman sings his thanks to Britain. Now, may I ask you your name? Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. Now, I'm told that you are really the king of Calypso singers. Is that right? Yes, that's well, now, will you true. sing for us? Right now. Yes. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city. You can go to France or America, India, Asia or Australia, but you must come back to London City. But this is the place I wanted to know. London, that's the place for me. Both my parents were Jamaican. Um, and they came over in the 60s. Uh, my uncle originally came over first in the 60s when he moved from Jamaica to the UK up to Sheffield, which I believe is quite a rare place for people to have come to at first. Most people went to London or Birmingham. I'll instill in the children about the history of Jamaica, where they're from. Obviously, they were born here. I was born in Jamaica, came over here in 1999. And um, yeah, so every time when we have a Jamaican holiday, we tell them why that holiday is about you know about the maroons and you know going back into the history and they'll hear me sing some folklore song and ask me what's the meaning of that song and you know to explain to them well my parents are both born in jamaica so i am of jamaican heritage i've been there on holidays but i've never lived there well both my parents are jamaican um been there on holidays uh like yvonne i um I just grew up being me. I never thought I was any different from anybody else. I, I, I grew up in a very predominantly white area, so I never, I never thought of myself as different even. I, did, I didn't even um, think about it, really. I was born in London, raised in Derbyshire, and now I'm studying in Sheffield, but both my parents were born in London, um, but their parents, so my mum's parents are from the Caribbean, they're both from Jamaica, and my dad's parents are from Cyprus. Um, and my mum's mum came here just after Windrush to London and has lived there ever since. And my dad's parents came probably around a similar time as well from Cyprus to the UK um, to work in this country. I know from my parents' uh, experience that they felt privileged to be asked to come and help rebuild um, and I know that was a general feeling in certainly their parts, districts of Jamaica. It was a rude awakening to find the conditions as hostile as they were. Yes, the, te the weather was something which they didn't anticipate but they could handle that but it was a hostility of the indigenous population which they really found difficult. And having faith, having uh, a real faith to, to hold on to was something which was uh, instrumental for them staying. I know a lot of, not only my parents, but a lot of other people said because they had the community groups based around um, 
faith by their own church, it allowed them to meet and have some semblance of solidarity. I remember my mum telling me how cold it was once because she had a room that was in the attic and she said she, uh, she did some washing and she hung it out thinking it would dry because it was a bright day and when she went to take it in it had actually frozen because she just didn't understand the weather um, and she assumed because the sun was out the weather would be warm she said and I actually had to take the clothes back in and they were, they were frozen. <laughs> I think when my uncle first came over, there was a, a lot of discrimination and segregation, which still, I feel, continues today, but maybe um, isn't around as much or is a bit more it's hidden. Possible. Yeah, yeah. So it's more of a minority than a majority. When my uncle came over, like I said, he had the shop. He had a shop as well when he first came over, uh, which wasn't far from here, actually. Um, and he had that for many, many years, and he did yeah, face a lot of racism while he had that shop as well. They weren't told that, listen, yes, you're here to help rebuild, fill out this form for you to have your naturalization or citizenship so you're free to go and come as you please. And I think that was the downside from day one. You know, they're happy to have them here to rebuild. But once, to me, it seems that once the rebuild is done and they've done many years of work here, the children's growing up, they've got grandchildren here going into school, you know, paying into the system, and then you get told that you're no longer here, your, your status is not valid because you cannot prove that you came here on legitimate reasons. I currently work in a home office and I'm involved with the Home Office Windrush Task Force. What's happened is a lot of people have been uh, victims of ill-advised or certainly ill-practiced government process in terms of not re uh, registering their status. We are there to help assist, get people to have their status recognised and then further on from that look to see if we can provide compensation for people who have in many respects suffered catastrophic losses in terms of losing jobs, losing are losing housing, being become destitute, being deported, um, not being allowed to come back to the country, being detained, a whole myriad of um, issues which have happened because of their immigration status not being correctly documented on their arrival. Within my role as well, we look at the widening participation section, as we refer to it, um, and the fact that you are black puts you in the widening participation section, which means that they automatically feel you're going to underachieve before you've even been given that opportunity. And sometimes we feel that those children or those students or those adults have to work twice as hard to show that they can do the same as everybody else, when really in this kind of society that we live now, everybody should just have the equal opportunities. We were kind of set quite a um, broad brief um, at uni, which was simply just protest and to pick any kind of current political issue that interested us. Some of my previous work I've been looking at identity and my own identity and um, particularly now because of um, Brexit and things like that and there's this whole kind of like anti-migrant, anti-immigrant rhetoric that's come about. So I was just quite perplexed by the whole um, kind of deportation of the Caribbean migrants and the generation of people that came here during the 40s and 50s. And how could something like that possibly happen when these people have come here and contributed so much to the country? Part of the length of the text is talking about the length of history between the two cultures. Um, and... Also, the colours that I've used in the text. So part of the text is in quite like an imperial blue that sort of reflects back on kind of like the opulence and the wealth of British culture. And then there's some parts that are in quite a vibrant green, which was sort of symbolic of the kind of like natural landscape of the Caribbean. So this sort of um, contemporary kind of condensed font here at the top was inspired by um, the Windrush font on the front of the ship, um, which is quite similar. Um, and then the green 
Fun is the um, Gothic script, which goes back to sort of the Empire years in Britain. And then the last font is this um, 18th century kind of vernacular, which, um, as I said, you'll see kind of in engravings and memorial plaques on buildings across the country, something quite similar to this. So I felt that that was sort of quintessentially British in a way. I think sometimes parents that came to England maybe hadn't thought that far ahead in terms of how their children would be affected by the culture that they were bringing them to and that we were living in, and that it was almost inevitable that we were going to lose some of our sort of Jamaican roots and identity because we were absorbed in a white British society. Our sort of late teens, early 20s, when my parents um, took us all into the what was like the front room, which was the best room, and you always knew that it was a serious conversation when you went in there, um, and just sort of sat us all down and said, well, we've noticed that all our children have got white partners, like boyfriends or girlfriends, um, and we're just wondering why this is. And they did seem a little bit upset by this fact, but as we explained to them, you know, not rudely, I hope, that we lived in a predominantly white area. We went to school with mostly white children. Um, there were only one or two black families in the area that we lived. And that you make friends with your peers. You don't go out seeking white people. And as, as I said to my parents also, they always pushed us academically um, and wanted us to, you know, go to university and to do well. And at the time, it just seemed that mostly white children were in those situations, were at university and things. So that's who we were friends with. If my kids were to do anything wrong, God forbid, then it would be the, Jama the Jamaican. Send them home. Well, where are you sending them home to? They were born here. So... I'm thinking ahead that, not making it easier, but they've got the choice of, hey, hang on a minute, I'm a Jamaican dual heritage, I can go and come as a place. Yeah. And that's, again, is just keeping the culture alive, that they can go to Jamaica and be accepted when they go to Jamaica without any hassle either from there. Mm. We're just used to the habit of, you know, singing Christian songs, and it's just embedded in us that we have to, you know, there's the, the faith, that there's the Lord that you have to believe in, you know, to get to get on. You can't do things on your own, basically. And um, so we do sing songs, and my son, even when he's doing the dishes, you can hear him from upstairs, you know, singing the same songs. <laughs> you know, and funny enough, with the songs that we were singing, what we do sing on the weekend, we come here on the Sunday, and it's already on the program ready to be sung, and he look up at me, and I look down, and he's like, yeah. He heard us. <laughs> Another thing that I try to do with the kids, what we do back home as well, is to um, memorize the Psalms, so like Psalm 100, Psalm 46, Psalm 121. You know, these were meaning, you know, the Lord is my refuge and strength. So there's meaning behind it, not just saying it to recite it, but the meaning, what it means. So I do try to instill that in the kids. Another part of uh, schooling as well, especially not just during RE lessons, but you have a, a speed finding the the chapter, like knowing how to find the books in the Bible. So, you know, the teacher might say, right, Exodus 20, chapter, you know, verse 1, read. And you raise to find, you know, the first person to read, stand up and read it. So that's an exercise. So I get them now to find the books on the program when it's on the surface, to find the books, whether it's Luke or uh, Matthew, and get them to learn the books of the Bible as well. So that's my input into the Christian faith into the kids. I think my brothers suffered more with racism. I, I, I didn't, I've encountered a few sort of um, incidents in the streets where somebody's just shouted things in my face, which I, I thought was bizarre. Um, and some very sort of not so subtle comments like, oh, when I worked in Barnsley, have you been to Blackpool? But I'm rubbish with jokes, so I never even got it. <laughs> I thought, we were like, what was he talking about? <laughs> Surprisingly, you know, adults said, sort of said they didn't want a black um, elf visitor or a midwife visiting them. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to know it till I, I knocked on the door and then um, it was afterwards I was told that. 
And I was like, oh, well, you know, um, interesting, because I didn't get that impression from the person when I uh, was talking to them. To me, there's almost, also, almost like soft and hard yeah. racism. So I think the, there's a very subtle form of racism mm. that you can get underturns. When we've been on holiday before to like Bavaria and places in Germany and things, and we've walked in with the children um, into like a little, and you suddenly notice most of the supermarket goes slightly quiet and turns and looks in your direction. And no one says anything, but you definitely get this feeling that, oh, there's an atmosphere in here. I'm conscious now of where I pick to go on holiday and where I don't. And actually, that's one thing I'm quite grateful for is that my children don't have that sense. They go wherever they want to go. And sometimes I feel a little bit fearful for them if they're going to like Eastern European countries and things where I think, oh, there might, might be some racism there. But they seem to have the self-confidence that they go anyway. Mm. And, you know, they're quite unaware of that. And I, mm. I think that's a good thing. I thought, you know... I I'm not going to let somebody else make me feel uncomfortable because it's their issue, it's their problem, yeah. you know. So I yeah. never, I never. And that is where it me. comes from, isn't it? Yeah. It comes from other people, yeah. And yeah, how they try to make you feel, yeah. and I suppose then it's having the strength to not give them that power, yeah. But it's difficult sometimes, and I think I feel very protective towards the children if I'm in a situation and the children are there and I'm getting that sense, then I do feel very protective towards them as well. What we're trying to do, both me and Lizzie, is, that, is to uh, understand, make people, make our kids appreciate that they will be viewed first and foremost as, as black. They are mixed heritage, but the indigenous population will still see them as black. So it's vital they do have an appreciation of their own culture. Um, whilst they are, and whilst they always will be, appreciative and understanding of the different dimensions of both cultures, they know that they are in between both, but also equally in both. So in cooking, my daughter is 13, my son's nine, you know, helping out in the kitchen, so the cooking of the Caribbean cuisine, as they call it. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so we encourage them. My parents are still in Jamaica. <laughs> So we keep that link going and um, we encourage them to just keep it up, you know. I mean, I still enjoy Jamaican food. I try and cook it occasionally. The children absolutely love it and want me to cook it more. Um, but they're always telling me that what I cook is nowhere near as good as what their grandmother cooks. <laughs> so every time we go, you know, to my mum's house, it's like, oh, Nana, can you cook the rice? Because your rice is so much better than mum's. And yeah, and that is just... A sort of joke within the family. Certainly our son, he probably identifies with Jamaica and that heritage I'd say more than the girls but I think that's more because of the music and he hangs with groups of boys that seem to really identify with I think that part of their heritage. Religion in in the Caribbean in the 40s and the 50s was very 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 much part of the community. It was, it, it was intrinsic in the, in the community and that was another one of the cultural shocks when they came to England they didn't find it as strong but they automatically went to churches expecting that same level of welcome that same level of involvement and they found that wasn't the case because they thought well if not welcomed by, by supposed fellow Christians what do we do our faith is still fundamental so we form our own churches. My parents got married at this church. I'm still here, so <laughs> something went well. The government have kind of recently said that they're going to start celebrating Windrush and um, sort of like empowering organisations that want to celebrate Windrush. I think they should always be remembered. And the reason why they came over in the first place, following obviously the Second World War and, and the need for jobs and for workers. So I think it should always be celebrated. I think it's it's good. To, I mean, we do remember each year the veterans, the people who, who soldiers who fought in the war, who, who are alive and who've lost their lives. So, you know, likewise, the people who helped to rebuild Great Britain, as you know, as the Caribbean um, countries will say, will say, you know, the motherland. So the fact that we once came here to rebuild, you know, why not celebrate that? You know, and that will 
it, the, the people who, even though they, they might not be in work, but they're still alive, will ha have some sense of belonging. An achievement. An achievement to know that, you know, yes, we did work in the steel industry. Yes, we did build the underground. We did help build the roadways. And to know that, yes, you know, we're celebrating. Every year we have the puppies and stuff. Why not have it for other people who helped to rebuild this country? It's a good thing to have, but it's also kind of like a very small gesture that we can do to sort of give thanks and celebrate the contribution that um, people have given to this country. I think there's a lot more we could do, but it's a good start. I fall, you lift me up, glory to be, oh God. Uh, I worry thee my saving grace, I know I'm not worthy to see your face. I try hard but I make mistakes, you're still by my side every step that I take. Through every heartache, I you get the praise, I you I'm a guide, I'm a shield always. Every time me I gaze and I play hard days. You still show mercy and keep me safe Lord